Okay. Uh, is that readable still? I think it's the same size still. Should be. <laughs> Ja, ja, wenn ich es noch, wenn ich's noch ja, öfter ja. höre, dann überziehe ich, weil dann kann ich es später anzeigen. Sehr gut, okay. Leute, wir fangen an. Das Video läuft. We're starting. Okay, I'm starting. If you're interested, it would be nice. If you just sit down, please. Okay. So, whatever. Okay. Thank you for being interested in such a topic most people aren't. Obviously, it's here the same. Um, no. <laughs> now for the real shit. <laughs> okay. Um, because I delivered that lecture some two or three years, I don't know, I, I forgot, uh, ago here in, in this room even, I think, um, about how to generate code. Um, it was actually about how using the tool chain and basics and stuff like that. Uh, and because uh, PepSync is 100% uh, generated software, so which I can demonstrate, for example, so you really, um, you really can go in and mess up with it and press make and you have a new implementation, probably with a bug. I think. Um, and then you just say um, make. I, I really can do that. Let, let me find an example quickly um, where I can show you that it actually works. Um, for example, we could do the following we make here a go grouped, which is now every device will be grouped, right? <laughs> And so I just uh, make, and you will actually see that it will make the full stack, obviously, and uh, probably I should deliver some parameter to make it faster. And then after make install, I have an implementation of that now. And if I use my test bench. I don't know if I should do that now, M maybe later I can show you that it actually is using it. So, um, obviously this is a case of generating software, which, which works nicely by the way. For example, our other example, just for features that you see where, where this is going to. Um, for example, I, I remove, where do I have that, I remove that bug. And I will now trigger an action which is no action defined yet. This is an undefined action, right? It's not in the API. You cannot do that. And uh, if I press make, then it will actually hopefully tell me that this action needs to be implemented. It's not part of the sync API or of, or of the engine. So obviously I, cannot use, I can only use a, a defined stack, a stack of actions. And so if you have a typo or something, this is the usual thing what your compiler does, right? It tells you that actually you did it wrong and things are going wrong and you need to define it and then you can use it actually and stuff like that. So it, it's a real thing. It's not only theory. Um, trying to find that and kill it again. Um, well, yes, um, this is Mercurial, so I have a chance to find out what I changed, right? <laughs> Let's say. But this isn't that hard. No, <laughs> that isn't hard, that hard, right? So actually, uh, that is, just to give you um, an impression, this is a way to define software and then generate an implementation. And now you quick in changes. And I don't know if everyone here in the room was listening to the, to the lecture I was mentioning, how the toolchain works, because the toolchain, uh, by the way, the, the toolchain is free software, is everything which I do. So if you're interested in 
you can download it here, or well, if you have internet only. It's my homepage, fdik.org slash YML. And there is the toolchain which is being used for that. And this toolchain is uh, obviously a code generation compiler toolchain. And it's a toolchain with a special feature because it's based on Chomsky's idea of base grammars. So if you're not familiar with that idea, um, in, in practice that means if you write any shit which looks possible, and which is close enough to C, okay? It's a C-like thing. So you can put, uh, for example, uh, braces in it as well. Uh, then this makes an XML tree, okay? That's, that's a basic idea. So you, you saw I did not define a grammar, right? I did not define a grammar. I just wrote text. And if it's C-like enough, then it will be passed. And you, you will get some shit out of it. For example, I make another example for a more C-like thing, right? I think that is that is now fairly C-like. I think it's not C, but obviously, but it's like C, right, in syntax. So I think we can pass that, right? And that is the idea of having a base grammar. And the base grammar here is, well, pretty much like you do it in C. That's a base grammar. And then if you dislike the base grammar, uh, how do you find that out? Well, uh, you try it out here like, me, like I do, right? You put it on the comment line, write your shit, have a look on what is the come out. If you dislike what has come out, you can bend the grammar. I call that grammar bending. So instead of writing a grammar and then you can start to work, you start to work immediately and if you dislike anything, you bend it until it's at the place where you like it. So it's just um, a different way to write compilers, let's say. It's not exactly the way how usually you write compilers. Usually before you wrote your grammar and before it's exact, you cannot even start with the language, right? And here it's just the other way around. You just start and play around and it's interactive and what you dislike you bend until uh, you can start to like it. And uh, what is that? Um, there is um, a language for um, how to bend it to the, the grammar bendings. So it's a grammar language but it's a special one because it's not defining a grammar. It's patching an existing Grammar, and I call that grammar patches, what you use to bend the language, okay? So bending is in language, grammar is being patched to bend the language. That's the speaking. And um, I should, I, I think for this presentation, because I have two less time, I should, um, probably it's here, and I will comment it out, I think. Oh, no, what was the, the comment in VIMRC? I forgot. What was it's the like, comment? It's like, it's exclamation. Exclamation? I think it's like. Okay, uh, but that does not look like. I think it's a quote. Or a quote, yeah, a quote. Okay, let me test that one. Yeah, oh, yes, that looks good. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Okay, uh, it still does it. Why? I need to explain it. Oh, you mean... Fuck it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you for helping me out. Okay, so basically what you see here is, is not really defined, right? It's in the first step, it's a DSL by just writing things. Because if you write things, then the DSL is implicit. That's, that's the DSL, whatever you think would be a good idea to have a DSL, which is write things. And then it's there, and then it works. And after that, when you found out, so I, I did my 
sketch, okay, how would you, well, state machine could be a good idea, FSM, yes, but I need one uh, sending and receiving network messages, so we need that mapping, which I explained already, between message and event and stuff like that, you know? So I just wrote that, and after you write it, of course, you can document it. But the documentation is mainly in comments, right? Because there is no grammar, if you don't need one. And then you start generating code of it, and of course, internally, this is XML. I can show you the XML. So you get an expression that it actually is. Um, because I just converted to XML. So that's the same file. It's just, it's just C-like, now it's with angle brackets, right? And you can see it's still the same, it just has way more angle brackets, right? It's basically the protocol and the FSM and the version and now the condition is really not if but condition, right? And stuff like that. And you can imagine that in the beginning the if was an if here and I would have liked to express that it's really condition because then uh, if you write the generator you can say if there is a condition then do the following, right? So that's more beautiful. So I use the grammar bending here, right? To just replace if by condition, for example. That's how it works. And, but that was the last time already. So um, this include file here is defining what I call a Y language. A Y language is grammar patches which map from the base grammar to the real grammar of your DSL. And that's it. So the, the, the tool you have is these declares. Um, can we can you read that on the left side? Or? I don't think it will help if I move my laptop. <laughs> so, um, yes, okay, still readable. So what I did is, if something is behind the protocol, that's the attribute name of it, right? Before it was, you saw it, it makes big um, containing in things, and now it's an, an attribute name. And what then is optional is, the next thing which is coming is the ID, there may be a threshold defined or not, if not, then that's the default. So you can use uh, those grammar rules, which are grammar patches, you can use them for um, also documentation and giving defaults, right? Because the default is also more in the meta language, let's say. So that's uh, now the meta language, and I used it here for extensively for documentation. So there's the documentation how that special type of DSL works, right? And I think that most of the documentation, of course, is, as I said, is just comments, because it's not needed. And yes, and of course, that declare language is part of the toolchain, and uh, I gave a lecture about that, and you can read it on the homepage, it's all documented. Each thing here is documented. So, if we have such a toolchain, the next thing what we need is a generating language. So we need something which is reading that defined stuff and writing out, for example, as in one grammars or writing out graphics file for the picture or writing out C code which implements that, right? Stuff like that. And so um, part of this toolchain is also a template language, which is what I call YSLT. And there's a very reason for it, because it's nearly XSLT just in C grammar. And actually, there's a Y language for it, and it actually is XSLT. Just no one wants to use XSLT, because if you ever have used it or tried it, it's a big fuck up. It's full of angle brackets, which are not easy to type, and you will not love it. And the next fuck up which it has is that they are mixing white space for the code indention and white space which is being output. And that's really crazy if you generate code. <laughs> so um, that's how my two chain started. I wanted something which is, well, replacing XSLT. I ended up with having XSLT as my bytecode in the interpreter, right? 
So I generate XSLT, which is then um, generating the code. So uh, funnily, this is basically generating code, which is generating code, which is generating code, right? And it's often, it's not only three, sometimes it's even six steps. So that makes it fairly complex, let's say. <laughs> but if things are getting complex by combining them, as usual, they are all simplistic in pieces, right? That's the Unix principle, so that gave the idea here. So what I'm doing, I show you the... Um, I show you the, the YSLT definition. And you will find out that this language has a definition which is 101 lines of code. So with defining 101 lines, I added the features XSLT is missing and map it in a syntax where you, want, where you start to want to use it. That's basically the idea. So you see, uh, of course I'm generating that. So <laughs> it's really generating the generator with which you generate the generator which generates the code which then goes through the compiler. Okay? That's a little uncommon, <laughs> uh, let's say. Um, but it's actually a good idea um, just to give you some benchmarks. For example, the full tool chain here has less than 1,500 lines of code. Because it's generating itself, right? Or it's generating the generators which generates the tool chain. So I just give you the benchmark. I have an idea why so many code generation tool chains are really bad to use. And my idea is if your tool chain has more than a maximum of 5,000 lines of code, I think you don't understand software generation very well, right? Don't you? And that is the problem. So if you common software generation tool chains end up with 200,000 lines of code and more and have less features than this. So I have the idea that software generation is not yet very common, but it's cool and sexy and I would love to have more people using it. And if you then use my tool chain to generate your own and then fuck my tool chain and throw it away, I win because then I have you, right? <laughs> because if you do the better tool chain than me, I love it. So that is, that is basically what I'm trying to achieve, finding people being interested in such a crazy topic, right? It's compiler construction from a totally different viewpoint. Okay, so now for real world example, which is actually a network stack with sync, how can you generate that? And there are some things which you need um, perhaps which we need to talk about first. Um, one thing is there is a clear connection between modeling theory and language theory and I will name it now. In modeling theory you have a model and a meter model. In language you have language and grammar. First theorem they are just the same shit. Right? A grammar is a meter model for the model of the language. And the semantics of the language is actually meter modeled by its syntax. That's tough to take and now, and I will not talk too much about the theory behind it. I just will comment on it that there is some. And if you think about what a grammar does, a grammar is either matching your language and then the, it's this language, right? Or not. And if you think what a meta model does, it's exactly the same, right? Either your model is fulfilling the meta model or not. And you find it out by trying to match it. So actually, it's even possible to see meta models as grammars of models. And it's a good viewpoint, I can recommend that. So it's basically the same. It's not even that they are analogous. They are identical. It's the same. It's two viewpoints on, on the same thing. A model is a formal description and a formal description is in a formal language and that formal language meta models the model always. So it's already a meta model. Can you follow that or do you totally disagree and I need to explain or we just go into implementation? 
question it to the audience. <laughs> Whatever you want. Um, we can, all other questions are beer questions so they don't disappear, okay? <laughs> so you're going to implementation uh, topics. So that gave the idea that actually an then implementation pattern is a meta model for an implementation, which means it's a grammar for the language of the implementation. Because that's the same. And that means a template is a meta model, which is a grammar for the generated code. And that means a template actually is expressing already all templates on planet, even the PHP guys who usually totally don't understand what they're doing, or otherwise they would, would opt for another language, I think. <laughs> um, that's a clear proof. Um, even they are using grammars, which are templates, and they don't know that, but it's the same strict. There's no difference between that. And that is by the, basically another tool which I'm providing, which is called PyPack. Oops, not here. Oh yes, it is here. Which you, it's yes, it's in uh, PyPy, so you can just download it. It's for Python three usually. And here you write a template, and at the same time, this is the grammar to pass. So if you write such with that thing, a, a grammar or a template, it's the same. It's identical. It's one language. Then this thing can pass, and I call it compose at the same time. And that is a proof that the theory is correct, by the way. So you write a template how you would generate it, and that is a puzzle. And you can just revert it. You write a grammar It's fairly uh, close to PEC, parsing expression grammars. It's just a model parser. That means it has a little more to express, because it's also a full feature template language. And then it's just identical. And you write one thing, which is like a template, and then it can pass and compose. So uh, there's, that's a proof. I'm not using that today. Still using YML. But what I did is, if you have that viewpoint that you're using design patterns as meta model for implementation patterns, well, yes, that works. Because implementation patterns fulfill design patterns, right? That's why we have them. If you see it like this, then you have like uh, a language, a, a sequence of languages or a sequence of models which is the same, right? And this is exactly, that's not my idea. This is exactly matching Chomsky's ideas of at the end you have a base grammar. That's Chomsky's base grammar idea. Chomsky is not working, I know, on, on uh, he's working on natural languages because he is a linguist and he's, I think he, he made that joke, didn't he, in some interview, I think I remember, uh, that he by accident invented uh, theoretical informatics. He was never interested in informatics and uh, I, he's sorry about that. <laughs> so, um, but we can learn from Chomsky also in other places, not only in the hierarchy thing, right, which we usually opt for in informatics, so that's another one where we can learn from him. And that's his idea, right? just adopt, adapting that, right. So the idea is, can I model my things in design patterns, and if I have them, can I express implementation patterns because if I have those, they are already templates, right? And if I have that, then I just can generate the full shit. And that is actually what I'm doing. And now for the praxis, because that's, uh, here's an implementation, so actually it works. How does that work? Well, obviously, do we have any design patterns? Can you see any here? I would say state machine. Sounds even like an implementation pattern, like it's like a design pattern for protocols, but at the same time it's closely related to implementation patterns, right? So no big surprises here, right? If you if you take all these theory shit and just try it in practice, we'll see that it's actually wor working and helpful, and you don't need to think about so much theory all the time. It's just working in practice, and that's by by the way. This is 
how good theories work, right? <laughs> if the theory means in practice is really shitty, I would question that type of theory, right? If it's a good one. Just because I'm usually, I'm used to, to write the software and get it to work, not only be uh, interested in the theory behind it, okay? So I would say good theories are where this works. How does that work exactly? I show you some generator. The obvious choice is the state machine itself, because that should be easy one. Because if state machine is actually an implementation pattern or a design pattern, is already questionable, right? At least it's very clear how you implement the state machine. If you ask people programming PLCs, they will tell you it's about switch case, right? <laughs> Let's say. So in, in practice, that's not magic, right? It's more primitive. So what you can um, expect, I'll show you the outcome first, I think. Um, i show it in that language because that's what I output. Um, well, it starts with switch K, so it's a good hint, I think. Uh, but that's not really the, the real thing already. But if you go a little down, uh, it's pretty much looking like a state machine with plenty of switch case, right? And probably the switch cases are um, in steps here. They are contained in each other, right? And it's not a big thing that the implementation follows what you saw before. And the reason for that is really that state machine also is already an implementation pattern. So if you don't generate it one-to-one, -one, you're doing it wrong because it's already there, right? That's not the part where it's complex to generate. <laughs> so if you have an implementation pattern already, just do it. And you see it's a little longer because it's C, well, so it's not only... Um, let, me, let me show you, this is the case so. So it's some logging and in the init, of course, it's more or less, um, that's an action, call it as a function, of course, the function must be generated elsewhere, test for error states, log if things going wrong, right, and then, and, and stuff like that. So, like, one action gives 20 lines or something, right? So, it's not more than, than blowing uh, the thing with, with the boilerplate, right? That's the easy part. Boilerplate is always easiest to generate and you would be stupid uh, if you see a possibility to generate boilerplate, immediately do it if you generate code because then that's a way already. That's not the, the complex things. And you see here uh, that's sending a message, right? Sending a beacon in C, taking care of, of the of the error states and stuff like that and then next action and stuff like that, right? So the only thing which is different to other generators here, generating boilerplate they all can do, everyone can do that, it's easy. The only difference here is that the generate code looks actually like handwritten. The generated code looks like you would have written it as a good C programmer in C yourself. There's intention, everything is named, everything is at the right place, there's comments in it and stuff like that. And there's a reason for that and that is coming from the software engineering which I'm providing with the tool chain, which I'm recommending, because it's basically like this. The first application of each single pattern you write by hand. So it's not only looking like handwritten, it is the first one of them. Because the good thing about generating is same pattern again and you win already, right? Mm -hmm. Having it 20 times, whoa. <laughs> Having it 100 times, whoa. <laughs> right? So that's first time. So it's really about writing the first thing manually and writing in the best way how you would do it because you only write it once, not the 100 times you need it in your full implementation. So take your time to do it correct. And that has another advantage. 
And the toolchain is fully supporting, for example, I have an, ident an indention system which supports that the indention is following the rule of the generated language. And the reason is whatever you generate will, in practice, land in a debugger and will be debugged by a person who possibly does not understand software generation. For example, everyone who understands C can debug that, gas that stuff. Right? And find the bug. Probably that person cannot fix it in the generator, or you teach the person. It's not too tough. Here it's boilerplate anyway, so it's easy. But they can fix it in C and try out if that was the bug and report it. So you can, for example, qualify bugs by people who don't understand software generation, right? So it's practical. And that is highly important if you lead the software team, if you're a member of a software team, it's highly important that the processes you, you, you are used to to work together in a team are not disrupted, right? It's very important. And that's the first thing. And that's the reason why it's so important that that beast generates code which looks like handwritten. Next thing. How does such a generator look like? It's not generated, so how does it look like? And Basically, it, that's an example, it looks like this. Actually, I started inventing operators which usually are not part of your code. Usually, there's exceptions or there's escapes. And for example, the double pipe appears in your code, I bet, if you're writing C code, it's an OR. But usually it does not appear alone in a line, right? Usually not. And especially it does not appear alone in a line at the very first thing as part of the C code, right? That's uncommon in C. Even for C programmers there are still uncommon things. It's Perl where each expression is correct code, right? It's not C. So, if you start like this, then you kind of switch languages. So what is above it is YSLT. What is below it is actually C. And then I add operators where you can put the template results in, right? And obviously, I should use operators which usually don't appear in programming languages I want to generate, right? And for example, these are operators which usually don't appear. That's a special kind of quote. You may be familiar with it because we're in Switzerland. Um, that's, that's common here in the newspapers, right? I think NZZ does it. <laughs> so. I just opt for any other type of quote, which usually, well, we have Unicode guys, I'm so sorry, um, we have Unicode H's. So I opt for something which usually does not appear in your code because it would just be a syntax error, right? And then you can put in results. So you can make it a template, right? So the name template is not wrong, it's right. It could also be grammar, same. But okay, that's a different story now. Okay, and so what I'm doing here is mainly, and you will see it in, in the video of the other lecture, software engineering means here, you write it manually, you deconstruct it and put the template parameters in. Well, that, this could be uh, different from case to case, make it a parameter. And that's how you write templates, right? It's, I'm just explaining how, what you already do in other languages. And so by doing that, you write the compiler. Because you only need to write the backend because the front end is already there, right? So that is basically it's not magic. Okay? Totally not magic. It's really doable. And I wrote it uh, in this case, I made for example the name of the protocol which is being generated a parameter. Why? Well, keysync is the first, trust sync will be the next. Contact sync is coming, schedule sync will come, right? So, how will I write the new protocols? I will define the actions they need. I will define the conditions they need to test if they're not already there and part of the API. And if I have them, I write the state machine and say make. Right? So you can concentrate on the state machine, which is a good idea to have. So, just to mention it, 
if you write such a beast once, you not only can use it for one state machine, you get benefit if it's four or five, right? You get, really get benefit of it. Okay, so that is the basic concept of the generation. Now I'm showing you how the implementation is designed in design, in design and especially implementation patterns, right? How would you design such a thing in a network stack? i show you some, um, I have big letters, so I have not much space, so I, I'm required to um, do it on, partly on the comment line, I cannot only, only open as usual my VIM with the tabs. Sorry for that. So the first thing which I decided to, I'm now going into generated code, show you, and then we look back how that looks like in, in the template, right? So what I would love to have is that I would have conditions and actions which are C functions, obviously, right? That would be beautiful because then I can call them from C. A condition is something which, differ, which um, delivers a Boolean result, right? Well, that's not too complex, I think. And it should not return it because of the error values, right? C has no structured exception handling. So I think that's given. It's not a big thing. So what I need is a concept that I can send messages, that I can trigger events which are not related to messages, and that I can receive messages and convert them into events, right? That's basically what we need. So what we have is the idea of I can signal an arbitrary event, I can signal that a message arrived, please convert it to an event. I have something which drives my state machine because for the state machine what you need is a concept for parallelity. I mentioned it already in, in, in the lecture before. I want to have a thread where the sync state machine works on but it should work also in other um, environments. For example, we have PEP for iOS. PEP for iOS is using an operating system named iOS and threads are deprecated there. Apple has a concept which is called Grand Central Dispatch. And that means everything is asynchronous and you have jobs. And that should be possible as well, right? So you need something where I can map this implementation either to threads or even to single-threaded when people usually writing a short Python script want to use PEP, I think it should be single-threaded because that's what Python programmers usually expect, right? And I have the next one which is Grand Central Dispatch which is basically job tickets in a completely asynchronous environment. And it must map on all of them. So the idea was how can we map it to all of them? What would be needed? And that gave the following idea. When you have a state machine, which is based on protocol, uh, on, on, on events and messages, there is two very different types of states which are not marked as being different. The first one, but they exist. The first one is a state where you process things but keep the state. I call that a stable state. And the sex, let, let's say, for example, soul and group are stable states. That is something you don't find in the documentation of state machines, but actually if you know how to implement them, you always have them. You can analyze your own protocols and you'll see that. The next states are states which are like intermediate states. You get a message, go to that, wait for the next and go out. That's like an intermediate state you have, right? And now for the idea. What all state machine implementations should have in common is that you go from stable state to stable state over intermediate states. So what you can do always and what you even expect it to do is that you take your state machine to the next stable state. And that is what I have here and that function which does that is called the sync driver. So the sync driver does the following. It not only ticks the, the, the state machine once, it ticks it until it keeps the same state and then it ends. And so you have a driver 
which, which reflects that property of all state machines in practice. And that driver now can be exactly what you do in one job ticket, right? If you get, this is the data, the input for the state machine, this is a state machine, drive it. If that input is a job, then you tick it until it stays in the same state, right? That's a stable state. And if, if you have that on, a, on, let's say, a single thread, well, what you do is you continue looping, right? You do that until it ends in an end state. That is what we commonly do on a thread with a state machine. It's simple, right? That's the obvious solution which everyone does anyway and which you find in the books. But now you can do the following. You have, as part of Sync API, you have do sync protocol step. And you have do sync protocol. And if you have a look on the implementation of do sync protocol, guess what it does? It's not too complex if you have the idea, right? It's, it's not a big thing. So you can use two sync protocol steps for the job tickets, and you can use just a ready-made while loop. It's even there. It's a feature, right? You could write it yourself, but it's complex. It's, I think, uh, 10 lines of code or something. So it's part of the API. So the documentation says, if you have a single thread implementation called this, if, if you have an extra thread for sync, call this, if you have a job ticket called the same with a single threaded one, why? Why is that the same? Well, it's the same because you get some input in your single thread and you tick the state machine until it, it's stable, right? It's the same. It's like with job tickets. Just that the job tickets call it asynchronously while this one calls it synchronous, right? It's the only difference, but basically you have one function for these two cases, and the second one is even hyperfluid. I know it's, it's a feature being friendly to people who have problems with starting threads. They get a ready-made function for it, right? So they can start a thread with it. And it's not complex. You see, it's, it's thinking in, the, in, that is advertising now. Think in patterns. Think in implementation and design patterns. It counts out, believe me. End of apps. That was that. Okay, so if you think that and you think through, you have it. So what I have here, guess what the sync protocol step does, you will be totally surprised what it does. It's incredible. Where is it? It will receive a message. What? Is that all? Shouldn't it just call the driver? Well, yes, um, this function is doing that. <laughs> this function is calling the driver. Why? Because this function is reacting on receiving a message. Why? Again, back to the problem of multi-threading and parallelization also with fully um, asynchronous implementations like Grand Central Dispatch is not the only one. What do they have in common again? They have in common that if you send a message and it's received on the other side, it must trigger an event. But if it's running on a different thread, you need to decouple it. So if you have, if you have the, the receiving of the message and you have the processing on different thread, obviously decoupling is being needed, right or wrong? Obviously, that's the case. So, who is, which one is driving the state machine? I would say the receiving end, right? So, what you should do when you send out is, or when you receive an event or message, is you should feed a queue in case of parallelization for decoupling, 
And then you need someone, for example, the thread, sucking at that queue, right? And taking event, now it's events, it's not messages anymore, because message added the event that this type of message with that data arrived, and other events may be added events as well. They are chop tickets like, again, well, chop tickets sounds like fully asynchronous, oh, we could match that. Okay, um, so as a result, you have that decoupling. And what you do if you want to have a single-threaded implementation and map, now you need to map it back, right? Because the default is now having a queue. For single-threaded, that's hyperfluid. We don't need the queue, right? It's only one thread. So how can you map it back? I'll show you the code. I just go to Python adapter. Um, and I'll show you the code. Let me see. It should be here. I think it's here. Oh, I'm stupid, as usual. Sorry. So if it's single-threaded, what you actually do is, if we are on the one and only thread, just drive it. Right? Don't feed the queue. You just connect the ends, right? If we are not on the same thread, well, then probably this is multi-threaded. And if it's multi-threaded, fill the queue. And there must be a sucking side. And fun fact, this implementation now has the feature in Python that you decide if you have an extra thread. It will work with the tool. So if you create a thread and run it there, it will automatically put a queue in the middle, right? <laughs> While if, you, if you don't, if you use Python as it's meant to be, one process one, with one thread, right? Well, you don't. It's just working. You can try it out. So, basically, now we have the mapping of the parallelization problems. And again, number three, grand to central dispatch, which is one of the options where you have chop tickets completely asynchronous. Well, it's nearly already working. Guess what you do? You don't drive your own queue, right? They have one already. Use it. Then it's tickets, right? So, and that's it. So you see, if you design it like this, you don't have the problem space. You, if, if using implementation patterns and try to map them to each other is also meaning you're avoiding many problems and lines of code, right? Because just to, to do three implementations with different semantics, I think should be, well, should be work, right? And, and this way, because just of thinking about until when do they come together and from when are they, 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 they diverge, spares you the time. And, and that is why I think it's a good idea to do it like this. Okay. Just to make it clear, also the Python code is generated. And the Python adapter is also a generated code. Uh, that's very bad message now. Not yet. Not yet. It should be. There is actually, <laughs> there is actually, you know, I have the following problem. I don't have many members in my staff who actually know how code generation works. And so I have the problem to find the balance between we should generate that fuck I don't have someone and well we actually can do it because they all love it by the way. I had, I had a very great feature, the best one per, probably about my own team. My team is great and uh, I will count on each person there. But there is one thing which especially impressed me. I was trying to find people being interested in learning this and usually you get like, if, if it's 10 people in the room, you can be happy really, if, if there is 200 people, because most people don't care. And I, I think they're wrong, but of course everyone has his own interest, there's so many uh, different interesting topics, I agree. Okay, so 100% of my team applied to learn it. <laughs> so, <laughs> So let's say I have the impression that in the future in PEP you find plenty of generated code. <laughs> so uh, next thing what we set up as a project is that we set up uh, generating 100% of the adapters. Because by the way that's easiest. <laughs> because adapters is adaptive pattern that gave its name, right? And adaptive pattern means nearly semantic free. It's, it's implementation of interfaces, right? That's it. 
So uh, that's nearly as simplistic as generating boilerplate. So you sh we should do it, of course. The only reason I don't do it is I don't have the people, which is not true anymore. <laughs> so let's see. So what you find in a branch of PEP engine, by the way, if you're interested in that topic, is already, uh, we already have a branch for it. <laughs> um, what was it? Branches, I think. Um, which is generate API. And surprise, surprise, one second. Um, don't give a shit now on what I typed. Um, here you have uh, a directory which is called API, and guess what's in? This is actually the idea to describe the different parts of PEP API in a DSL. Because today, you know, uh, PEP is being implemented in C, C++, Java, Python, um, Objective-C, uh, what is the name of the other, Swift, in, I, I don't know why. JavaScript? I, yes, JavaScript, uh, what do we have? That's already implemented, okay? C sharp, C -sharp yes. yes, correct. <laughs> so, let's say round about 10 langu languages already and it will hopefully be more, right? So you see, that, that, that makes plenty of adapter code, right? Because what we do at PEP is we try to fulfill the usual things which, are, which you are expecting as an application programmer from your environment. So it's not a one-to-one -one mapping. It's mapping into the culture of the language and of the development environment, right? And how can you do that? Well, you generate the code because otherwise you just be drawn in, you sink and no air anymore and <laughs> that's it, only adapters, right? So, <laughs> so if you do a change and so that is why we are working on it and that is, uh, it's not more than a preview yet, actually it's already good and we're starting to write the generators. And then there's no reason not to generate the adapters. And of course, it will be a little better if you do the API change here and say make. <laughs> okay? <laughs> I think it, it will count out and we should do it. And you will hear about that project in the very first lecture uh, I gave about PEP already, just I never did it. <laughs> and now it's happening. It's happening. Okay, but let's go back. Okay. Um, no, update, um, sync. Okay, I'm going back to the sync branch. The sync branch is, is like testing. This is what will be the new default. <coughs> we just right before um, release, so this is what is coming now, going to use the test, and if we have that, then the stamp there, then it will be the new release. Okay, so what can we do there? What, what, what else do we need? So we have obviously a boilerplate implementation of the state machine. We have the concept of having conditions and actions and uh, a way to call them and check for the error states and stuff like that. So there, okay, what do we have? We have the concept how to tick the state machine, right? And how to do that in different ways on different types of parallelization concepts on the different operating systems. What else do we need? One of the major things which we need, I'm skipping some parts by the way, just for making it short in time, unfortunately. What else do we need is a way to write actions and conditions. Because that needs to be expressed, right? I, I cannot just. Uh, make a declaration of a condition and expect that it's actually checked, right? That's too much. So I need to at least write some lines of code what is being checked in what way, right? And usually that is one of the common problems you have by code generation. How do I combine handwritten algorithms with generated parts, right? Because this is something I want to express algorithmic or it will not work. And believe me, um, let's say, how do they call it in UML, action diagrams are not the, the way you want to do it in practice. Otherwise, happy hacking with UML. 
right? Try to use that, what they call an uh, action diagram. How, how was it called uh, in the old days? I think it was uh, a structured diagram, or what was it? No, I'm not talking about sequence. Struktogram, yes. I don't know the word in English. It, it's really shitty, right? It's, it's way better to write some lines of code and that the algorithm is there, right? So we have something, how to combine handwritten code and generate the code because at least the expressing, the boilerplate it can generate, but the, the, the few lines which express now the condition or the action should be handwritten because otherwise it's more complex and it doesn't help, right? And a common trick to combine them is called inversion. And I will show you that because it's so often that you will need it in practice. So we have here something which is conditions and actions without boilerplate. So it's like, tell we are grouped, well, in the buffer of keysync, set the is group flag to true, right? You may remember, I show you the files now, we have those buffers, I show you the files. That's also network implementation. Um, it should be... Oh no wrong directory, that's why it's not there. Um, it should be here. So we have buffers and that is now the concept of the network implementation. We have an own state which covers things about our own state machine, right? Then we have state we assume our communication partner has, which we learn by the messages coming in. That's the state we assume on the other side. And then we have transport data, which is, for security reasons, maybe important data which is related to the transport we are sitting on, but we want to learn and use for security reasons. Uh, especially, who, whom are we talking to with which key? Right? That could be important for a key synchronization thing. And then we have the buffers. And we have one buffer per protocol because if I start with keysync I have one protocol so I have one buffer. And the buffer here is the superset of all fields. Right? That's the buffer. And if we go if we go to sync FSM so we will see that I'm starting with a beacon, you will see that the fields have decent names. It's not arbitrary. It's really the negotiation and the challenge are two different transactions or transaction IDs. But if it's the negotiation ID, the field always has the same name. So it's not that you have as many names for fields per message it's that you have the fields per protocol so you can build a superset, right? So you need to, to think about that in the design here of the implementation. So if it's the same thing in, call it the same name so you can have a superset of the buffer, right? And that is how it works. So I'm just reading all the defined messages, reading the superset of the fields and that gives me my input and output buffer, right? That's how it works. And then I can rely on that, that it's actually there, right? That is the I.O. buffer of Keysync protocol, and there the is group flag. And that is, tell we are not grouped, means I set the is group flag to false. And you see, because that will generate C, that it's not the full C function, obviously, right? because you need to check the input parameters, you need to return an error value if the input parameters are not correct, you need to check out of memory conditions and all the bullshit boilerplate you need to do in that shitty language, right? And so basically, you want to generate that code, obviously, right? That's not the part of code you want to have handwritten. And that gives the idea how to combine now handwritten code into generated code. And that is, uh, the feature I'm doing that with is called inversion. i show you why it is. I just uh, try to explain why it could be and then i show you why it actually is. What is that? An action. 
But this action is part of the generator. So it's not a template, right? Well, it is. It's a special kind of template, and action is another name, word for template, it's XSLT, mode, action, name of that thing. Because then it's a template to generate only one time, generate that thing. And then I can do the following, then I can write a template, which is matching that, and having the name of the action as parameter by calling it, and by doing so, I have exactly the situation that it templates, it stamps out exactly what I'm writing here. I'll show you the code how I'm doing that, you will be surprised, it looks a little weird. Um, it's this. You will see this is the code. This is really inversion, not kidding. I tried to explain it. A condition is an inversion of this, and an action is this, and timeout is a special case. Okay, how does that work? It does the following. Again, this is a template for generating a template. Because this declare language is bending the grammar. But bending the grammar is changing the grammar. Changing the grammar following a pattern is a metagrammar. Right? Can you follow me still? <laughs> it actually is. Why? Because it's meta, meta, meta model, meta model, model. Right? It's meta, meta grammar, meta grammar, grammar. Right? It's the same. So actually, you cannot only do that forward, you also can do it backward, right? And then I call it inversion, because you only have one standpoint, this is where your declarer is going. And either you declare forward, or you declare backward, right? <laughs> so you invert the declaration, right? And that's how you do it. So just to give you a feeling, how the f does that work? You do the following. It's actually a template for generating templates. So what you generate is this here, right? And because it's one step before, you can do that, right? You have that feature. And now you're doing it the other way around. You generate the template, and if the type is condition, here goes condition, right? And condition means it goes here, and that means it's a template for a condition with the name this. So, for example, if it's this, right, it's about these things here. For example, if it's an action, if it's an action tell we are not grouped, that means it's a template matching an action with that name, right? So actually, this will generate one template per case, which is usually not how you use templates, right? But, well, because it's one generator, we do it. We feel free about generating many templates, even if they're only used once each, right? If you don't need to write them by hand, right? So <laughs> actually, you can do that. So this is generating a template which matches an action with the name, tell we are not grouped. And for whatever that thing spits out, it's this. And what is this? This is a function call in XSLT, well, also in YSLT. It spits out a content function. One second. And this is, for example, for conditions. Oh, we had an action, I'm sorry. This is for actions. So for each action, this spits out, well, that's a C declaration, right? Of each action, you saw that already in the code. Here goes the name, and an action has no parameters, but the pep session where it belongs to. Why do we have a session concept? Well, I already mentioned Grand Central Dispatch, okay? So probably, if, if you don't want to go into problems with parallelization, you should have sessions. And then it's boilerplate, shitty boilerplate, and then it copies just whatever you wrote in between, and then it goes with the shitty boilerplate at the end, right? 
So actually, this thing will generate one template only for that single case and this template will use that function to generate the template for its content. Because the boilerplate is always the same for all actions, right? So I have it once. It's the same, of course, for conditions. With the condition, well, the boilerplate is different, right? Because you return a result with the condition, obviously, it's a Boolean, right? And so the boilerplate is checking a little different and, well, it's not complex, right? It's not complex, but you see we are now a little more into the generation part. That's not only boilerplate, right? It's generating a generator which calls a function for generating the generator which then generates the function. Or for being lazy. <laughs> But actually, you are very lazy if you do that. Believe me, I am. Sometimes it's a little tough to find out how to be as lazy as possible. I agree, but <laughs> that may be. But um, yes, but it counts out because then it's, it's a couple of lines of code, right? Just the idea you need, the inversion ID that you now can write just something which then is being generated into a template and then applied, right? And it's even better because that matches so closely the idea of YSLT and XSLT that you get the error messages for free. I'll show you. Because XSLT has that feature and YSLT has the same because it's just another syntax for it. It's like syntactic sugar, well, uh, some features more. Um, I can expressing, I can express a general case for all conditions because what XSLT does, if there is a specialization, this one is being selected automatically. And if there is only a general one, this one is selected in all other cases and that's a feature of the language already. So what I do is, if one template instance is coming out of the template mint, it's called, if there was no such a thing, well, an error is being generated, right? So we get those sweet compile time errors. Don't underestimate them. Don't underestimate that we are here in a real software development group, right? It's not possible that you generate and if something goes wrong, it's just not working. No one will find this bug, right? Believe me. It's actually required that in the error cases we have a clear error strategy. And that is why I recommend for combining partly generated code and manually written one with generated code, I recommend inversion. That's, and that is now a clean room implementation of it. So you have an example, I don't know. Uh, if the time is enough, of course, we can go through all fields. I hope I gave you an idea. They told me they kicked me out here, but it's not happening. Are you relaxed? Sorry? No. No. How are we in time? break after this, so it's one hour, eight minutes. Okay, I, I have a good feeling for the time this day. <laughs> okay, I still had no beer, I think that's why. Um, uh, something we should, it's an error condition, right? Which we should change, I think. Um, didn't you mention beer? But uh, that yeah, but later. I'm okay, cool. So, <laughs> I take that as a promise this time. Okay, so I think one hour was meant to be, right? But do we still have time? Let's do 15. People told me we have one hour and then they will kick me out. Is that not true? That's that brilliant. Let that we still do q &A. Are you still here? <laughs> Shall I continue? You still have 20 minutes. Oh really? Okay, I didn't know that. Okay, even more? Wow. Okay, I now timed for one hour. <laughs> okay, great. If it's more... Are you still there? Are you still interested? Shall I continue? Is that a no? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is someone able to formalize a question? Oh, that is a good question, yes. <laughs> <laughs> do, do I need to raise the, the white flag already? <laughs> no question.
questions, we can continue. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a rough estimation now, right? <laughs> that could go wrong. Sorry? Please. Why not just use some high-level language and just do some like high-level language feature which allows you to do some introspection that just like generate everything into like some kind of self-contained thing? Uh, because of SetOS and because of QNX and because of um, a list of others, including Iron itself. This will change now a little because I have a very good feeling now about how to port Rust language to Iron. Because there is a project now which really looks good. But uh, I have weird platforms. And so uh, I have the platform definition is the following. All my platforms support a subset of C99, even not the full thing. That's what I found. Why not C99, the full thing? Because Microsoft Windows does not. <laughs> okay? So, um, that's not true anymore. It's so, I'm so amazed about the new features of Visual Studio 2017 <laughs> because now Microsoft support fully supports the C language standard of 1999. <laughs> I think this is really amazing. So, we can drop the subset, right? No, I don't mean like that you need a language which is supported on all the platforms, you just need a language which is like JavaScript or whatever, and then it works on your platform and then from that you can generate all the code, all the code like for QNX or whatever. You will see what will happen if you do that, you just rewrite YSLT. Yeah, but the key point there yeah. is that you don't invent your own DSL. So if you ask, oh, well, you will have an own DSL, it will be probably in JSON. Yeah, so in some way. Well, no, no, if you're using JavaScript, I would use JSON, wouldn't you? No, no, why don't you just use JavaScript? Oh, well, you know, why don't you just use X XML and XSLT? Because it's fucking horrible. <laughs> uh, well, I don't use it, I generate it. <laughs> it's not horrible at all anymore. You know, the very reason for it is that it has the XML tool chain is underestimated in one point. It nearly has all features already I need. So to bend it away into a situation where it gets usable was very easy. So I would say instead of writing, let's say, roughly 8,000 lines of JavaScript, I write round about, I don't know, to 1,200 lines of Python. That's the result. Because the implementation is in Python. And then use the XML toolchain because it's already there. It's like I import what XML can do, I import like a library, right? And I have it. And of course you can use some JSON library which nearly does the same. It's not that you cannot do it in JavaScript. No, no, my question was... My totally question not. Was just like Possible. Instead of DSL, just using some language as a DSL. I you know, so you, know you have an internal DSL if you have a fully reflected language and you are required to use an external DSL if your language doesn't have that. It's not more complex. So if you have Ruby or JavaScript, I would say in Ruby you want to have a DSL and in JavaScript you can. If you don't understand the difference, try it out and see which language is beautiful and which one is ugly in reflection. So, you, but you can. If you have a language like C, which I have as target language, you cannot. It's not possible. In C, you just would be required to implement Lisp, an old saying by the way, <laughs> and then you have a fully reflected language, right? <laughs> just write a small Lisp interpre interpreter and it works. But if you don't do that, if it's really just plain C, it's not possible. So if you have languages which you generate which are uh, not fully reflective, then you need an external DSL. And now you can decide. You, for example, can opt, that's a possibility, I fully agree with you, you can opt to write your toolchain in JavaScript. Possible. There's no reason why it should not work. You also could do it in Python like I do and import the XML toolchain so I don't write everything. 
That's a, that's a decision, right? What you do? Well, I opted for the second one because XSLT has so many features uh, which are already needed and I don't do implement them myself. That's the real reason behind it. Probably today you find JavaScript libraries, if you combine them, you come close to that. Right? That's the answer. No special reason for it. Well, the XML toolchain has some advantages if it's going to software proofs. Because XSLT is a pure functional language, language and pure functional languages are very easy to prove. So if you want to have software proofs which are based on patterns, I would say if you want to repeat that feature which that toolchain has, you should um, define a pure functional subset of JavaScript, which is possible. Okay? And you need to stick with that then for the generators. And then probably that does not fit into your libraries anymore. And then we are in a region where... No, 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 I'm kind of a guy who like, the last feature of a language supports to go like this. Sorry? I mean, I'm not really used to proving or anything. No, it's okay. I'm just answering your question yeah. or trying to, to deal with it, right? Yep. So, uh, that was one advantage I saw that, that XSLT is pure functional because from the beginning I wanted to go into software proof. Mm -hmm. And the idea is to separate the proof of, of the templates and, and and uh, the patterns, and then uh, by you know you, you can sh like generate the proof for it, right? And run it on a prover, and it's not complex because it's pure functional language. It's the easiest way of a language that is the, the type of language is easiest to prove. There is ready-made two chains, which you can download as free software from the internet, by the way. And that was one of the reasons. Another was that XML toolchain is is ninety percent already there. And I'm lazy. You may be surprised, that's actually true. Um, I was teased to use Ruby because of its beauty, to be honest. So I just didn't find good Ruby um, implementations at the point of my decision where I can do things like having libraries which do the indention of the generated code and stuff, you know. It's not only the DSL part, that is even better in Ruby, I would say. But, but that, the output part is, is more weak because in Ruby, usually you do it for Ruby, right? You don't do it for generating external things, which is still possible. And I'm pretty sure I could have used Ruby in, instead of Python without problems by just importing some XML library and doing the same stuff. And then it ended up with my then software team when I invented that shit, which was around about 2007. Uh, I was the only Ruby programmer there, and they were all using Python. And then I adapted. <laughs> That's how I found to Python, by the way. And I found Python so ug ugly, really, so ugly. And today I find it so practical. <laughs> it really changed. <laughs> so that really changed. But is there a very good reason? Beside that, I would say no. Repeat it in Ruby or JavaScript. Why not? I would I would love you doing that. By the way, I would love to see you see your result and uh, let's compare your ideas with well, mine. Actually, let's learn from it. each other. That would be cool. What I would do, however, is I mean, if I need to support a shitload of platforms, yeah, I would probably just invent my own language. Not my own language, but like my own virtual machine or whatever. Yes, you have to be careful at one point, again, just to remind you. <laughs> I have one platform where you get without problems COBOL, PL1, and Assembler. <laughs> because that's the most common languages there, okay? You really can forget having JavaScript on it, okay? And it's hard to have C on it. There are special cases. <laughs> just to make a concrete example, okay? And that's why. And I knew I will get that platform that I just didn't knew that I will do it in banks. I was sure this platform will be one of the PEP supported platforms, and actually today it is. That's unavoidable, because if you go to huge organizations, if, if it's financial industry, not only banks, for example, uh, MasterCard or any, any uh, insurance thing or something, you will still find mainframes. They are there. You cannot ignore them. 
in practice. And PEP is a concept which tries to be as portable as possible. And by the way, um, today I'm sure we completely will switch to Rust and away from C. I'm completely sure because of the very good ex first experiences we have with Sequoia which is written in Rust. So actually we are thinking about starting a project to port Rust to MVS. I'm not kidding. We just will apply at Mozilla and at IBM if they want to finance that because we would love to have it. So if you ask me what I see in the future, I will try to, talk, to drop C. Well, I'm doing that, I think, since when I'm doing C, I think it's uh, 87. I think then I started to try to leave it again. <laughs> so you see me not very successful yet at <laughs> that point. And then I found something even way worse than C, which is called C++. It's, if C is nightmare, then C++ is hell, I would define. That's, that makes the plus plus, that's why the plus plus. And I immediately opted for leaving that again, I'm still doing it. Most adapters in PEP are in C++, so you see me not very successful at leaving that too, as well. And there's reasons for it, it's just what I have, right? And what is running on the platforms. And, and if I get some beauty, like Rust, on all platforms, I immediately kick the two of them. And it's really looking good. It's really looking good. Rust is really something, I would say, this can work on all platforms. And for sure, it's a language. Um, there's, there's a small list of languages you may love, but Rust is one of them, I would say. Yeah. It's really practical. And what I see from the Sequoia code is just great. Yeah. Just going back to what we are actually talking about in, in this talk. It's no. independent no. of the language you target and how beautiful it is or not. Your things are so high level that I don't care and I remove everything that I have in this code. Well, I rewrite the templates, I have Rust, right? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Sure. And I even can make the language a parameter. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, and it's even going... Yeah, sure. That that's I the whole thing here. Yes, CSL exactly. Where I can concentrate on my own project independent of of the implementation, that's the real benefit. Well, I not generate hardware code for FPGAs on the other hand, and your tool chain is fully adoptable for that, no problem. Mm. Yes. So as I can focus on my problem, and you mentioned a really important word in my, uh, my opinion, provability. Yes. Because, as you said, you have these simple logical steps. Yes. The end thing is very complex, yes. but I can prove every step. Yes, and you can generate the proofs. It's simple steps. Exactly. And, and it's that's practical. It's so important for, for something like PEP. Oh, yes. Because it's privacy. We need oh, yes. formal proof at some point, if possible. We are working on that together with the University of Luxembourg. Yeah. We already started a project and there since two years. And and there are so many other industries and applications where we'll need that. Safety or security should Full with you, that's um, why. And you only get these benefits when you go these, these levels in abstraction up. Yes. You don't get formal proof when you go with abstraction down. Fully with you, I think you're right. So. That's why I'm doing it. Or one of the reasons. Mm -hmm. And again, we are already in that project. Yeah. And you get so that let's see. Free. But the, and you get it for free, yes, but um, I will make another step. This will be the project, you know, PEP is like an intermediate side project I have. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, more like, it's more later, Leon, I, I told the story already, Leon came to me and were asking me, was asking me to do, uh, if we can do something like that. It was not my idea, it's basically, okay, we can, Leon, let's, let's try. And I have a project which I started right before and which I want to continue after when PEP is set up and working, it's just some billion of users and I'm fine, right? And then I drop out. And <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, okay. And uh, what I really want to do is I designed a language which is based on these concepts on which is completely round-tripped in all cases. So what you see here is 
I mentioned it that PyPack already is parser and composer with the same grammar or template is the same again. It's, it's no difference anymore. YSLT is not yet. YSLT still has a direction and I need inversion if I want to do it the other way around, right? That's what I just explained. With the language name Intrinsic, which I have in mind, which I did all proof of concepts that it's actually possible and working like I have it in mind. The proof of concepts are done, but the implementation is, is started and I never had time for it anymore because of that small side project here, in here. Um, <laughs> that thing then is a language with that paradigm. And inversion is implicit. So you can just write the both ways. And you just can write the proof in it. I can show that one. But I only can show it as definition. Well, I don't think so. I think I need more time for PEP. Unfortunately, there's small, some small steps still until we have the billions of users, right? It's not yet ready done. It's looking good now. You find me fairly optimistic, but let's see. Um, but after that, I want to do that because it's really needed. I'm, I'm totally with you. It's, and I think I know how it works. You know that feeling if you know, if you think, well, I think, proof of concepts. <laughs> it's not, I don't have an implementation to test it, okay? That's two different things. Careful, I, I know that, but, but I think I know how it works. And, and this will, uh, by the way, solve more problems. For example, I think I can completely solve the parallelization problem. And we all know now there's a proof that it's un unsolvable, right? And I think the proof is right and I can solve it. <laughs> because the proof has a precondition. And the precondition of that proof, if you have a look at the paper, is that they argue inside one language. But I have a stack of languages and meta languages. And I just go upstairs and go downstairs and have a parallel implementation. And that's just not covered by the disproof. So I think I can solve the parallelization problem. I think I can solve the problem to move code into hardware. If you, if you have that view on code, you can have the view like this. We all have that already, I think. This is uh, a dynamic implementation. This is a static implementation. This is a static implementation in place. I'm using a map, right? In place. And this is an implementation in VHDL, right? Well, is that possible? Well, can you roll it out or not, right? So, can we decide about how deep we get that? Yes. Is that a decidable problem? No. Is it semi-decidable? Yes. Does that mean we can define a decidable subset? Yes. Right? Can we identify that subset? Well, that's a semi-decidable problem. By the way, just kidding? No, not kidding. Have a look on it, it is. So, yes, I can decide it for many cases, right? And if I can go upstairs, that's the question, why was that implementation chosen? Well, because that was the problem to solve here. Well, do we have the possibility to write it in implementation patterns? Do we have in-place implementations or even rolling out in VHDL as an implementation template of that implementation pattern, yes, okay, move it into the hardware, right? So this is really compile. It's not optimization. It's minus D, D for depth, right? Let it, let it in, in the space of, um, of uh, reflective dynamic. Move it into in place, right? Or move it into the hardware and have a decision, have a compiler which can decide, or if it not, cannot decide it, it just makes it here, still works, right? But for, for the decidable parts of it, move it down. And I think this could even change how we build computers, because in, in this case, I think, uh, maybe your standard computer wants to have an FPGA, right? If your compiler can move it into, not decided yet if we want to have it or not yeah. because we do not know how to address address the software to it. 
that's exactly the missing part. That's the missing part, yes, exactly. That the missing link, and I think intrinsic, which is the come out of these things here, I think it can deliver exactly that. Yeah, that's exactly the same with GPUs and all the other... The same the shit, theory. can we compile it for the, the GPU works? architectures, everything that's... And it's even getting better. Can I cross-compile existing code from an arbitrary language where it's already there? Yes. Did I do that already and proved it? Yes. Again, I have my proof of concept. I did the following. I generated the model. I was in machine construction. Machine construction means these were machines for packaging pharmaceutical products, like blisters. Uh, or, or bottles, something like that, okay? And so I did the following. I got uh, around about 200,000 lines of um, SPS, uh, PLC code, which mostly of it was structured text. And I wrote a compiler which reads that and writes out a machine model of the machine. A machine model is actors, sensors, in which station, in which part of the machine, right? That's a step up. Yes, that's a step up. So there's a proof of concept for that already. By the way, the project took me four days. And I started without the compiler understanding the language where it was written in. Because of course I generated the compiler. If you want to see the project with a beer, I do. No problem, and I want a bet with it. <laughs> By the way, and I want a customer with it. <laughs> because customers ask me, that sounds so crazy. How long do you think will it take you? And I said, well, I think three or four days. <laughs> and he told me, I don't believe that. I say, okay, you pay only if it works in that time. <laughs> and that's why I always joined it. So I could move people there by doing that. And, and and this is a proof of concept that, that you can go up with that ideas, right? Mm -hmm. And you can. It's there. The code is there. I published it as free software, by the way. You can download it and have a look on it. If you see it, it's fairly simple. It's not many lines of code, by the way. Well, three days, you know, I'm not a magician. Or, uh, I'm not a wizard or anything. I'm just a worker. So I need to move my fingers to write lines of code, right? And, so it cannot be many if it's only three days, I'm sorry, <laughs> including testing four days. So that's actually it. I hope I can convince you to have a look on such things. It's so less people who like it. I hope I find more who could like it. Um, on that note, where do you start? How do you get into this? Where can you go? Uh, I would say, if you have boilerplate or best an adapter pattern, generate it. Just do it. All the tools are designed that you just can do it. Without theory, without listening, theoretical informatics, forget all what I said in that lecture. Just try it out. It's software, download it, try to understand it, write code. And because an adapter pattern is best case, right? Because there's not much semantics. Semantics is something which you can handle, it's not true you cannot, but that you handle in the other layer, right? <laughs> so, so for semantics you need already at least two layers, syntax and semantics, right? If, and it's easy to start with one layer and then add in the net project a project where you, where you have two of them, right? Mm -hmm. So that's how I would do it. And by the way, if you want to have basic ideas of the toolchain, how to use it, if you want to use mine, I would be proud. <laughs> if not, use anything else. No problem. If I can convince you to deal with that topic, I think I'm already uh, on the winning side to find other people liking it. And uh, you use some toolchain, and if you want to learn ma about mine, it's, it's uh, a video in the net. I think it's three years this event. And so I introduce the basics. Okay.